Welcome to another set extension tutorial for DaVinci Resolve or for Fusion Studio. This time I'm using footage with a moving camera and I'm placing two photographic elements into the moving shot. So the techniques covered in this tutorial, I'm using the 3D camera track to get the, extract the camera movement and then I go into Fusion's 3D environment and use a card projection, place two photographs into that 3D environment in order to come up with this set extension. As always, you can download the footage from my website together with the solution files if you want to have a look at it. I should mention that for this tutorial, the 3D camera tracker is only available in the studio version, either the studio version of DaVinci Resolve or you can use Fusion Studio, whatever you prefer. Uh, in both ways, get the footage to follow along and when you're ready, let's get started. Okay, so let's start directly from the Fusion page or from Fusion Studio. I have loaded my source footage. So I have here on the left side this forest clip and I have this barn picture which was already cut out in Photoshop and a signpost here which is just a graphic element also with an alpha channel already prepared for me. So starting from there, what do we do? First, I want to get the camera track. So I get my virtual camera which emulates this movement and then I go into the 3D space where I can place the elements. Let me bring in the camera tracker from the tools menu and attach it here to this forest clip. So control spacebar for the tools, camera, camera tracker. This is the 3D tracker. And this tracker, even though it's just one node here in the flow, it actually represents a whole workflow of, of tracking um, techniques that you apply here. So if you look into this tool, there are multiple tabs and basically you work your way from left to right. So if you're not familiar with the camera tracker, I'll just give a brief overview for this track. It will, won't be too difficult. So camera tracking can be anywhere from super easy to completely impossible depending on um, what kind of shot you have. So the principle of this tracker is that first you select or the tool selects tracking points on the on uh, distinct features of the image throughout the timeline. Then with the selection of these tracking points, the actual tracking is happening. So points or features in the image are being tracked in 2D on the image. Then afterwards, you can also give some camera information. With that camera information, there is a solver. The solver uses the tracks in order to calculate what the actual camera position uh, would have been like, right? And then once you have that, you can export this into, uh, into the flow and can get actually a camera object and a 3D scene uh, with uh, certain reference points, can get those uh, pasted into the fusion flow. So let me just do this. I go here into the camera tab and the first thing you can enable here this preview auto track locations and then you see if you go through the frame and let me bring this into the, this we don't need, let me bring this into the view. You see here the tiny little green dots um, all over the frame. And these are the points where Fusion uh, believes that there are features that can be tracked. And this is selected automatically, but you do have some control. You have a threshold. Um, which if you bring it down, you will see more points. So this threshold says how much contrast should there be. For example, let's just zoom in on one. So here is one automatic point and I guess Fusion recognized here the contrast, um, this kind of feature, which can then be followed over multiple frames, right? Um, so wherever these contrasts are, are recognized, Fusion puts are the points and if you lower the threshold then more points will appear. Uh, just as a general rule, you need definitely at the minimum eight points. This is the mathematical minimum in order to uh, be able to calculate for a camera position at the end, but typically you should have much more. Um, you are in a good place if the points are distributed over the image. If you have a good amount of points in the foreground and in the midground and maybe a few in the background. If you have lots of points in the background like on the sky or so and not much in the foreground then the perspective calculation will not work. So you want a uh, good distribution of the points both over the width of the image and uh, from a, a depth perspective. 
it's possible to attach a mask here if you have certain areas of the image which are unusable or if there's an actor moving through the image or something like this, um, then you can do this here. We are in a relatively simple scenario, uh, so we should be pretty much fine with the preset. So let me now just um, do the click here on auto track, which is the next step. It runs through and does the tracking and then let's see what we're getting here. So now we have the color changed of the points and if I zoom in you see these uh, little um, path here, motion path for each point. So each point now um, was tracked over as long as uh, it was possible for the solution. So if you now go through the timeline you will see that some points um, might drop out of the frame either on the side or they can no longer be tracked and the tracker automatically uh, dismisses them after some time um, and new points are being added towards the end and that's all fine. Uh, as long as you have uh, in each frame a good amount of tracking points you should be on the safe side. Um, one thing to improve, sometimes you can do bidirectional tracking. If you enable this, it will track once forward and once backward in time. Um, and this can uh, give an additional um, improvement in some cases over the tracking locations. Uh, for this, I think this should be fine. Let me go to the camera settings. Now, the more you know about the actual film camera that was used, uh, the better. In this case, I actually don't really know what was used because this is coming from stock footage. Um, but I have seen on the site uh, that the cinematographer mostly uses DSLRs with an APS-C sensor, which is the like, um, I think this might be a Canon 60D or something like this. Um, so you see here a few presets. Uh, there are not many cameras listed here, but a few are listed. The point is if you select the preset, it will uh, set the aperture width and height here. These two parameters are being set automatically, so which is just the, the sensor data. So the Canon EOS C500, I believe, has an APS-C sensor. Now I'm not um, too familiar with all kinds of uh, camera technology, so I won't go into de depth. But basically, if you don't find the camera here, uh, either find one which has the same type of sensor or start looking up uh, in the manual or online um, what the width and height is and just uh, set this manually. Here it's set in, in inch. Uh, you might find it in millimeter, but I guess you can convert. Okay, so the rest usually uh, is default. Uh, focal length. My logic here, I don't know what lens was used, I don't know what focal length was used, but I see that the image is not really distorted. I see even the trees on the side are straight, so I think that uh, something in the normal range, uh, which for uh, this kind of sensor would be like 25, 28, so I just leave it here, I just leave it at the default. Um, if you have fish eye or extreme zoom or something like this, then it would be good to uh, adjust this. The better you get with these settings, the better for the solver. But if you don't know the settings, you can only uh, guess and try to get as close as, as possible. Um, then I go to the solve tab. And here there are again uh, different presets. Most of those we will not need, at least not for this uh, setting. There's one thing here, you see a setting refined focal length. So the solver itself tries to uh, also calculate the focal length again and, and get closer to my initial setting. So if this was not correct, it's trying to uh, improve upon this in the solution. And once I click solve, it starts calculating and depending on your machine and length and settings and blah, 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 it will take uh, maybe one, two minutes or, or longer or shorter in my case. So this was pretty quick. And now I have um, my solution calculated and I can see it in different ways. First of all, there is an error calculation and here it says average solve error 0 0.3 pixels. And this is damn good actually. So uh, the manual suggests that everything below one is already considered good and 0 0.5, 0 0.4 or so is considered excellent. So apparently if I go by this, this should be a very good track. And this is because 
my image here has lots of great features and uh, lots of depth and you know the tracking points are pretty good in this in this uh, image if this is not good and if you have to improve upon things then you can start looking at which of these points are better or worse and you find here in this menu above the viewer there are different settings and I always have to look into which is which but you can um, you have here a solve error uh, in this coloring uh, menu so different tracking points can be colored in different ways you can manually color them for to use them later for reference um, but it automatically can color here by solve error and I don't see much because of the contrast but if I enable this I darken the image and now you see some points which are yellow and some which are green so green are the ones where the solver figured out these points um, are pretty good and gave a good result. Yellow, um, there was a little bit of a problem and do we have any red ones? Let's see. Ah, yeah, here is something red. So here the solver had some, some issue. And if I look at where this point is right now, I don't even see any feature. I don't know what was tracked here. Uh, maybe it tracked, it tried to track the side of the tree here somehow. Um, not sure. So if you have a lot of red points, uh, you know that there are problems. You can also uh, enable the error itself. You can um, turn on all and then you see numerical values uh, where you have uh, the, the biggest um, errors in your solution due to which point. What you can do is you can delete individual points then. You can go back, refine this, um, uh, change the threshold if you don't have enough points all in all. So there are different things you can tweak. And typically you might have to run the solver multiple times until you are uh, there with the final solution. So you might delete some points, just mark them. For example, if I want this red one, want it deleted, I can just mark it and press delete key um, and it will just uh, be removed and then I can uh, solve again if I, if I want to. Yeah? So I can uh, run the solver after adjusting, uh, removing some of these tracking points. Uh, I can, can run it again, or changing some of the other parameters, maybe even change the camera parameters and then run it again until I get an error which is uh, as good as um, it can get. A second point you can do is this camera tracker. So I, I can see here the points. Let me quickly turn off the, um, the these values again. Uh, you can see the tracking points on 2D, but after you have solved, you can already look into a 3D scene as well. And how you can do this, you can just add a 3D tool, like a 3D merge or transform, doesn't matter, and connect f the one of these outputs here to this merge. And there are two outputs on this tool actually, and one output is a 2D output and the other one is a 3D output. And the scene output here, the lower one at the moment, scene output, this should be a 3D output. And if I connect this into my 3D merge node and put this on the second viewer, I already get a 3D point cloud here. So even before exporting, I can see here the camera. This is what was calculated, the camera movement that was calculated by the solver. And the points that were here on the frame um, put into 3D space as a point cloud. Now this point cloud here I can uh, later use for reference when adding elements and I can use the camera for my 3D scene. Once I'm happy I can go and go to the export tab and can here just click on, on export and this will give me a few tools in the flow. Let me increase the flow area now, bring this up a bit and let me move them somewhere down here maybe. So what do I have here? I have my camera here in 3D space. Then I have my point cloud. I have a ground plane, uh, which is quite nice. So this is a plane which was just uh, inserted uh, in a default place and I can adjust it. And then I have a renderer automatically here added to the end. You also see the image again projected into the scene. This can be nice for uh, orientation in the beginning. Um, if you don't want it, you can always disconnect this here. Yeah. So for now, let's leave it in. 
So the next thing I do is I like to adjust the, uh, the ground plane. And let me bring the 2D image in here so you see it here as well. And in the ground plane for now I just disable the wireframe for a second. So I see a full plane here just so I can see it better. And let me move this a bit. And I, oops, and I want to move this towards where all the, the points are from the ground. So if I look into um, my original camera track, you see that these points here, they were all tracked from the ground. So presumably these points, uh, the ground plane should somehow go through these points. Um, and again, the ground plane is mostly for, for reference when uh, adding 3D elements uh, onto it so that you know that, that they're really on the ground and not floating above and so on. So let me bring this to the lowest, through the lowest points here and move it up a bit. And I don't think I need to change the orientation. Sometimes you might have to tilt it a bit depending, you know, if the camera is tilted. Um, during filming it's possible that you get something here which is not flat but here I think the orientation is quite good. Yeah, so maybe that's not, the ground is also a bit wobbly so it won't be 100% but I think this is a fair approximation. If I go into the view again I can now, let's bring this again to wireframe now. Um, then okay so I can at the end I can just uh, disable it uh, before before rendering but for now I just use it for orientation. Now let's bring some elements into the scene. So I already have them here I have my signpost and my barn picture and I can use now the image planes to bring them in. So let's use an image plane for uh, the signpost and one for the barn and see where we can add them in starting with this signpost and now I need definitely a bit more space so let's see where it is okay and bring this in full screen so it's floating here at the moment and I definitely want to bring it down onto the ground plane so and maybe Maybe I, I make it again um, fully opaque like this or I can even go into transparency here and just give it a bit of an alpha channel. Maybe that's the right way to uh, navigate here. Oops, wrong control. Let me do it from the image plane, move this up a little bit. Yeah, this should be... Yeah. I think now it's almost perfect. Okay, now it's standing on the plane. Um, and of course you can also go by the points here, so especially since the ground here is not completely even, um, that may be even better. And let me bring it a bit forward. It should be in, oops, too much, way too much. And let me um, turn off some of the stuff here just so I can move a bit faster. Okay, let me bring this a bit forward, maybe here. And let's look again at these points here. Uh, okay, they are a little bit lower in this area because this is a bit lower, so let's bring it a tiny little bit down. Okay, now when I bring in the other uh, part, if I bring in this barn and let me bring this image plane in here and place it somewhere, where do we have it? By default somewhere here. Let me bring it here to the side and this definitely needs to be much larger. Um, let's go here into the scale, bring it up a good portion and I want it to appear at at the end here on the standing here on the side like this. So let's bring it 
Yeah, I think I need to bring it much, make it much larger. Let's see, oh, maybe that's too large. We'll find out and rotate it and move it again. And let me check compared to the ground plane. And maybe I should make this ground plane much bigger as well, just so that it's everywhere. So let me make this a huge ground plane. Again, the plane is only for reference. We can remove it at the end. And I need to bring this so somewhere above. Mm. Okay, so the points go till here. We are more or less on the ground. I'm okay with the orientation. Maybe I bring it a bit front and let's check again. Okay. Okay. Now that I have the uh, elements in place, let me disable the ground plane and then we can have a look at how things are looking. Uh, here actually I would say terrible. I would say this needs to go further to the front. I don't want this bright patches here. This looks not very good. So further to the front. So I will start somewhere. I will start somewhere here and then uh, do some improvements. Okay, let's uh, have a quick look at the scene in motion. So the signpost here, I think, looks pretty okay. This looks solid. And then as the house comes in, it looks pretty stable here. And yeah, I don't see any. Uh, at least from a first glance, I don't see any sliding or so. So I think the track and the positioning should be relatively um, solid. So next step I need to do is uh, work a little bit on the integration and uh, get this the color correct and so on. So first let me do quickly something on the signpost. Um, if you want, maybe you want to add a text to the sign. Uh, that's quite simple. Let me just do this directly in Fusion and add a text node here. Uh, not a 3D text, sorry. I can use a 2D text. Here it is. And a merge and just merge a text node over the signpost and bring it up. What do we want the text to say? I don't know. 3D set extension. And give it some, I don't know, brown color. And a bit larger. And now maybe I want to, in the merge, maybe I want to multiply instead of put a normal. Let's see how that looks like. Yeah, so it's getting darker into the wood and I keep the structure of the wood. Okay, uh, I, you can play more with this, but that's not really the point of this tutorial. Uh, just to have something on this board. The next point, I can do some color correction here. Let me do this overall. Um, after this merge, just add the color corrector and perhaps in this case, reduce the saturation a little bit. Oh, that's up to you. What do you think is, is working best here? Maybe I even leave it like this. Now one element that definitely needs some correction is this house, obviously. So let's look at the end. And this definitely needs color correction. Uh, it doesn't match at all into the scene. So again, let me add this. And first, I, I might even colorize this a little bit and give it a bit of a brown tone. Just a little bit like this. Um, I think it's good that it's flat overall, but I can perhaps reduce the brightness a little bit and maybe we work with brightness and contrast. I'll, I'll leave this. So definitely some bit darker. Uh, and now the point is, I think, not so much the um, brightness, but more the mo biggest problem is here the, the ground. Um, and let me see what I can do there. 
and I think I will first of all remove this grass here so I left it in when cutting it out from Photoshop to see maybe sometimes uh, you can can use it or can use some of this but this all in all looks not very good I will fix it in 2d and will fix it with a paint note let me add a paint note just quickly and I can use here on the color notes I can bring this down to completely black and alpha zero so now I have a paintbrush here which paints with a which basically paints with transparency so my paintbrush will cause transparency and it should do this over the whole duration so I will in the stroke duration I will just make this um, maximum so um, this whole thing here is 500 frames whatever like 1000 so I just want to make sure that everything I paint in um, is permanent and now let me bring the paint into the view here and quickly I can remove here and I'm using the paint tool rather than a polygon mask because I can make a less perfect um, more natural kind of mask here so I can just go around here and maybe I leave some of this stuff hoping that it fits together with the, the other grass and make sure that otherwise I'm not uh, too perfect and not just have a straight line because the new ground will also be a bit wobbly so I think this looks better and let's have a look how it looks like in the final image um, now I definitely need to bring this down again a little bit just a little bit in the uh, image plane here y coordinate just so that we are covering this okay this is of course still not perfect um, and it won't get perfect here to be be quite honest um, but a few things you might think about first of all if I had a choice how to shoot this and how to integrate this I would say let's not film the ground here at all let's just frame this so that the house comes in somewhat like this uh, without the ground being filmed because then you have, don't have to worry about the grass and it will be much easier to uh, integrate this element now if you do want the grass um, the next best thing would probably be to go into Photoshop and try to uh, clone some of the real grass I mean from the from the footage and try to paint it a bit on top so that there's a little bit of, of grass here on, on top of the house that could work you could theoretically you know create real 3d grass or something and put that into the scene but there we are getting really into um, way too complicated stuff for uh, a simple fusion compositing tutorial and out of this domain here what I want to do is I want to give a little bit of appearance of grass uh, by uh, painting out some some grass I just go into the paint note here let me go again to frame zero I quickly take my drawing tablet and just make some very fine let's bring the size of the paint brush down um, and just do very quickly here some some transparent things that look a bit like like grass at least from a distance and I just do very quickly some something like this and let me accelerate this okay this will not lead to the most realistic grass ever but if I look at the end I imagine that this looks a little bit better than before and we are kind of faking faking it a bit here um, yeah not perfect but if I let's turn on high quality for a second so this is how it now looks like on the ground and I think that's at least better than what we had before even if it's not perfect okay um, final thing let's look at the light behind here uh, this has very nice lighting the scene and if I look at uh, some references here if I look at the trees you see that there's actually light um, blowing blowing over 
so everything gets a bit blurred by this light. So what can we do here? Um, we can do something like a light wrap and where the light from the background is going a bit over the edges, spilling a bit over the edges of the foreground. And I think in this particular scene, this may be the right thing to do. Um, yeah, so yeah, I like to look at this tree here. So you see that there's light kind of wrapping around till here and then only here the tree gets darker. Um, so the, you have this kind of uh, diffuse glowy uh, feel to it. And if I look at the house, uh, we don't really have that. So uh, what can I do? First of all, I think it's time to go from 3D space into 2D. At the moment, the reason why I see everything here is if you remember that the camera here is projecting the scene. So there's this back image here, which is coming from the camera. We don't really need this, so let me disable this. So now I have only my 3D elements rendered. Instead, I go here from the forest scene and merge this over just with a simple 2D merge. And now I can use whatever tools I want in 2D. So here I will now build the light wrap or, or something similar to a light wrap. And a tool that is pretty nice is this matte control tool, matte control from the tool menu. And this can basically uh, extend and shrink the alpha channel and do manipulations like this. Let me show you what I mean. So if I blur a bit and then extend or shrink, you see uh, that on the edges, I'm, I'm manipulating the edges, bringing the edges in or out here. And I actually want only the edges now. So what I will do is add a channel boolean and subtract my uh, manipulated image from the original. So I add a channel boolean, connect my original uh, 3D output, uh, attach, subtract the manipulated one, select here, subtract. And you see now I have the edge here only and I can decide, let's uh, overdo it for the beginning, can um, ex contract this and blur it, then you see I get a blurred and uh, contracted edge. Um, probably I don't want this in the lower area, we'll see. Uh, for now, let's get started like this. And now I can uh, use a go back to this image, what I want to do is I want to blur the background and merge it uh, carefully over the foreground. So I will use a blur tool and from my background image get a very blurred version of this background, maybe like this where I don't recognize the features too much. Then I can merge this blurred version um, over the foreground. And I do this only as per the uh, boundary areas which I got here from this um, matte control. So let me put this into the mask of this merge. And now you see what happened. I merged a blurry background over uh, the foreground on the edges of this image. And of course, I can now uh, modify this. Maybe I want to only screen it, or maybe we leave it normal, but I can uh, reduce the blend, of course, and I can uh, further uh, adjust these uh, boundaries here. So now let's dial it. Maybe we leave the blur, but dial this back a little bit. So I can give this a very subtle um, glow here. Just for comparison, if I disable it, enable it, so you see what is happening. Okay, so this was a very uh, simple kind of light wrap. Uh, you might want to adjust this further, maybe mask it a bit, check does it make sense at the bottom, does it make sense at the roof, does it make sense on the signpost, uh, and then do all kinds of uh, fine tuning, and then you come uh, to a result like this one in this tutorial. Okay, 
this was again a full basket of different techniques in this tutorial, starting with the 3D camera track, going over the 3D projections onto uh, the image planes in the 3D space and then doing some 2D post manipulations afterwards, in this case with this light wrap. I hope you um, enjoyed this, this overview. Uh, if you have any particular uh, thing you want to have more in focus, um, let me know in the comments. I'm thinking maybe the 3D camera tracker could uh, use a dedicated tutorial sometime later. Let's see, um, just to uh, get some more advanced uh, pictures into this. Um, otherwise, again, let me know what you think and what you would like to see. And see you around next time. Thanks for watching.